Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. You wouldn't think that studying lizards is a particularly dangerous profession. Until, that is, sheriffs approach you with their guns drawn. We get the cops caught on us sometimes. Bree Putman, a behavioral ecologist at UCLA and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Her colleague at the museum, Greg Polly, really did end up on the wrong side of a gun once, and here's why. A lot of times we're doing work at night in people's neighborhoods, and we're like using flashlights to look for geckos on the sides of people's houses. And so sometimes people will think we're criminals or burglars or something. The museum's solution was neon orange shirts with a museum logo. And we, we call these shirts the, the don't shoot me shirt. But the bright orange left Putman with a concern that the color would spook the very animals they were trying to study. So she devised an experiment. I basically designed the study to show to the museum staff that, that these shirts were not going to be good for research. <laughs> and that's what I found. <laughs> In her trials, Putman wore tank tops of various colors, red, gray, light blue, dark blue, and then attempted to approach and capture western fence lizards in public and private parkland in L.A. And she found that when wearing dark blue, she could get twice as close to the lizards compared to when she wore red. And she was about twice as likely to catch a lizard, too, while wearing dark or light blue compared to red or gray. The study appears in the journal PLOS One. Putman thinks that the lizards may be more tolerant of blue hues because they most closely resemble the blue patches males have on their bellies, a sexual signal. Other studies have shown that birds with orange and red plumage are similarly less creeped out by orange and red clothing. And though she's not ready to issue a dress code to hikers just yet... You know, for a scientist or biologist working with wild animals, you want to make sure either that you're wearing the same outfit every time you're going to do animal behavior or whatever, or you want to randomize what you wear. As for those museum shirts... I actually wear the orange shirt. (laughs) I don't wear a blue shirt. (laughs) Because studying wildlife in urban areas, you never know when you might encounter that other species, gun-toting homo sapiens. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Polar bears spend most of their time roaming the sea ice in search of seals. And seals spend most of their time underneath that ice, avoiding the top predator. But climate change is giving polar bears additional challenges in their searches for food. Sea ice is now drifting faster. George Derner is a research zoologist with the United States Geological Survey Polar Bear Research Program. He and colleagues compared sea ice conditions from 1987 to 1998 with those from 1999 to 2013. And um, what we found was that um, ice drift at the locations used by polar bears increased 30 percent in the Beaufort Sea and 37 percent in the Chukchi Sea. That's a problem because polar bears are homebodies. They prefer to stay in a specific range. Throughout the range, they seem to have a sense of place. Now, here we have um, a situation where the general pattern of ice drift is is westward. So to uh, remain in your traditional range, it means you have to constantly be walking eastward to compensate for that westward drift. The result? a large-scale polar bear treadmill. And all that walking requires extra fuel. On average, a single bear eats between 31 and 33 seals per year. But the metabolic consequence of the treadmill effect means they have to eat on average one to three more. The study is in the journal Global Change Biology. And not only is the ice drifting faster, it's also melting more, giving the bears less of the platform they use to pursue their prey, so they need more seals, but have a tougher time tracking them, all of which puts polar bears on a slippery slope. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwing. Fifty years ago, British inventors made and marketed the first electronic breathalyzer. The alcohol gauge has become standard issue for U.S. law enforcement cracking down on drunk driving. In a sign of the times, U.S. police are now hoping to enlist the so-called textilizer. The device, in development by a company called Cellbrite, 
plugs into a driver's smartphone and can tell police whether that person sent a text, email, or some other type of electronic message. Much of this information could be found by checking the device's call log and messaging apps, but the Textalyzer aggregates all of that information in one place. Sending or reading a text typically takes a driver's eyes off the road for about 5 seconds. At 55 miles per hour, that's like driving the length of an entire football field with your eyes closed, according to the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The NHTSA reports that in 2015, nearly 3,500 people were killed and 391,000 were injured in motor vehicle crashes involving drivers who were talking on the phone or texting. But several open questions remain related to the textilizer. For one, it's not clear how officers will access a device if it's password protected. The textilizer's legality is also up for debate. In 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that police officers cannot legally search a mobile phone for content created within the past 180 days without a warrant. Regardless, several states plan to test the device. Over the years, all sorts of bad advice has been given to help people beat breathalyzer tests. Let's hope the only way people beat the textilizer is by keeping their hands on the wheel and their eyes on the road. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Larry Greenmeyer. When you install an app on your smartphone, you're often asked whether you'd like to share your list of contacts with that app. That might be a convenient way to connect with friends and family likewise using, say, Instagram or WhatsApp, but it also means you're giving away their personal information to the app developers. And that personal info could end up being used to create so-called shadow profiles of your contacts, even if they don't use that app or social media service. Shadow profiles emerged as a potential problem in 2011 when an Ireland-based advocacy group accused Facebook of gathering information on non-users, including names, email addresses, phone numbers, and physical addresses. The following year, researchers showed that social network companies such as Facebook could use machine learning to pretty accurately predict whether two non-members known by the same member also know one another. Not exactly Big Brother, But a recent study in the journal Science Advances raises the stakes. In that work, David Garcia, chair of systems design at the SciTech University ETH Zurich, used the social network member's personal information to infer relationship status and sexual orientation of the member's contacts who did not have their own user accounts on that social networking site. He was able to do that using, of all things, data from the now-defunct Friendster social networking site. He says he chose those two attributes, relationship status and sexual orientation, because they can carry important privacy consequences and were both available in the Friendster dataset. Garcia is careful to point out that he didn't prove that shadow profiles exist, just that they can be created. His work also reminds us how much we wind up revealing online, about ourselves, and about the people in our lives. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Larry Greenmeyer. More than 900 years ago, the Pueblo people were thriving in New Mexico's Chaco Canyon. While they were there, the region experienced what the whole country is looking forward to on August 21st, a total solar eclipse. Theirs took place in the year 1097, and they may have left a record of the event. I I spotted this very peculiar petroglyph, which was a, a round object. Kim Malville is a retired solar astronomer from the University of Colorado Boulder. In 1992, he and colleagues were leading a field course in Chaco Canyon when he noticed a unique carving on the south side of a rock. Uh, Which was a round object with loops coming out of it. And it struck me as maybe this was a image of the sun with the corona in a very active state. Um, And maybe at that time, there was what is known as a coronal mass ejection. That's when a giant cloud of plasma spirals off the sun's surface because of a solar flare. It was somewhat um, foolhardy, I suppose, on our part to suggest a particular explanation for it. But Malville knew that he had a testable hypothesis. Astronomers know that the region had a total solar eclipse on July 11, 1097. During the brief darkness, the sun's corona would have been visible. Solar activity increases and decreases on a roughly 11-year cycle, so Malville used various historic records to find out what was happening in 1097. And all of these indicated that in 1097, 
the sun was indeed in a state of very high activity, and, and thus uh, we couldn't prove that this was actually a uh, image of the corona, but we could not uh, falsify our hypothesis. In another portion of Chaco Canyon, a pictograph high on an overhang has been interpreted as marking a supernova explosion in 1054. Below that, a pictograph may mark the sighting of Halley's Comet in 1066. And all three of them may have played a role in intensifying people's interest in the heavens and, and looking at the heavens very carefully. Which is exactly what millions of current residents will be doing during this summer's solar eclipse over North America. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwing.